If you enjoy interactive author discussions, welcome to Story Behind the Story with Reese Ryan, where romance readers and authors connect. I'm Reese Ryan, author of sexy, emotional romantic fiction featuring grown folks characters, finding love while navigating career crisis and family drama. And today I am so excited that we get a chance to chat with author Piper Hughley about her novel, By Our Own Design. I've been reading it and am loving this and I cannot wait to talk to her about it. And I'm fascinated about the whole process of writing a historical novel about an actual historical figure. So I can't wait to get into our conversation with Piper. <laughs> but first, I'm thrilled that you were able to join us here tonight on the final show of Black History Month. And we're going to have an appropriate discussion for the month uh, as we talk about this novel. And it follows the life of a historical figure in Black history that many of us may not have been aware of until we read or until this novel came out. So I'm excited to talk about this novel with Piper, our guest for today. But first, if you uh, thank you for being here with us. And if you're a regular viewer, thank you so much for coming back. Y'all make the show. <laughs> Y'all make it engaging and fun and I appreciate you. And if you're new here, the show is always very interactive. So, be, you know, you're welcome to share your questions and comments and we will address them as we can uh, throughout the show. And if you're watching us from Facebook, um, welcome. But you want to, if you are going to participate and uh, comment or ask questions, you want to scroll down to the bottom of the description on Facebook. There's a link and there you can give StreamYard uh, permission to see your Facebook avatar as well as your name so that we'll know who we're talking to uh, while we're having our discussion. And again, we're going to, we'll address your questions as you ask them. So by all means, please drop your questions, comments in the uh, comment, the chat box, and then we'll get to them as we can. And of course, if you are new, please, we suggest that I suggest that you subscribe. That way you don't miss future uh, uh, shows that we're having. And by all means, like, subscribe, share so that other readers can uh, find this content as well. And also, if you're new here, you after the show, <laughs> be sure to check out past discussions I've had with authors like Beverly Jenkins, Brenda Jackson, Kristen Higgins, Kennedy Ryan, Farrah Rashawn, Olivia Dade, and a host of others. So we're going to get on to our discussion today with our guest Piper. And I am very grateful to Piper to uh, for, for coming in and talking to us today during a period that is tough for her and her family right now. So I'm excited to talk about this and she felt it was important enough to come and talk about it with us. So I'm excited to have her here. So Piper, hello. hello. So good to have you here with us. <laughs> it's, it's good to be here with you Reese. Thank you, the distraction helps. Uh, I, I'm glad. I'm glad. Mm -hmm. So let's then let's get into it. Okay. And I am part lazy, but also I like to have people <laughs> introduce themselves as opposed to reading like a canned biography about you. So tell us a little bit about who you are and what you write. Um, okay, I'm Piper Hughley, and I write uh, historical fiction, uh, historical romance, and I have one contemporary romance. Uh, hi, Dio. How you doing? Um, I live in Atlanta, where Dio lives. Um, <laughs> um, what else? Uh, I'm, but the day job is I'm a, a professor at Clark Atlanta University. That's not it. I don't, <laughs> don't worry, we're gonna get into a lot more of it in yeah. a minute because okay. the first the I'll next watch. thing, so the my I'll next watch. question for you is you know, when you decided to be first of all, what prompted you be to become an author? Period. Oh, I've been um writing little stories and things off and on since I was 12, so it's like the, the first thing that prompted me was we moved to a new neighborhood. 
and I didn't know anyone and I was feeling kind of intimidated by the new neighborhood. So that first summer, I just kind of withdrew into myself and started writing my first royal romance. Um, the president's <laughs> a royal romance. The king's wife. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know what it was at the time, but that's what it was. It was a royalty romance. So and then I, you know, but I'm old enough to say that back in the day, um, I had to do research for the royal wedding and I called all the wedding places and things in Pittsburgh and I was getting all these big bags of mail and whatnot. <laughs> and I ran up my mother's phone bill. Oh my goodness. As we, had, as we, oh just my God. Moved, as we wow. moved into the house, you know, when you move into a new house, you have all those extra expenses and stuff. And my mother was getting this big phone bill. She's like, what? <laughs> wow. But she didn't punish me. She was like, oh, this child, she must be, this is what she must want to do with herself. And so, I, I love that she encouraged yeah, that she, instead of getting encouraged upset. It. It. Yes, she did not. Wow. Wow. Okay. So <laughs> then. <laughs> <laughs> what prompted did you, when you once you decide okay I want to be author or whatever what made you decide you wanted to focus on historical romance well historicals that came later uh where I finally realized as much time as I was spending in the classroom talking about uh the history behind the literature so that the students could understand the literature and then I kept trying to think about, well, what ways could they do more reading? Because youngsters need to read more uh, in a way that would be engaging, that would show them more about the history. And because uh, at the, that point, um, when I was starting to think about it, well, they were reading stuff like Zane. And I mean, you know, in college, you know, you know, that's what they don't want to read that or whatever. But I was, <laughs> there might be some other things that you can read that might be beneficial to your knowledge of history. Um, and, you know, I referred him to Beverly Jenkins and stuff. And I was like, you know, I was one of those people that would be waiting every October when she reads in October because I knew it was like for me because it's my birthday in October. And it's like, okay, yay, the new Beverly Jenkins. You know, whatever. <laughs> And then I was thinking about it, and I was like, well, um, we're waiting, you know, for her new book. I said, well, somebody else might put something out there. And then I was like, well, I wonder who that could be. <laughs> <laughs> and then it finally occurred to me, maybe it could be me. So, <laughs> wow. so that's when I um, made my first attempts um, for both between, you know, the students and trying to have more of the history um, out there. Um, about eight years. I ago. love that. I love that. Okay, so what? <laughs> so you're waiting for Miss Bev to put out her next novel, and you're like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write a, a novel. <laughs> so you start writing, and you're right. You've written lots of historical novels. You have your Home to Milford College series. So it's one thing to write this historical. You know, these are historical romances. And mm -hmm. of course, like you said, research is required and all that. What made you, at what point did you say, I want to write about a, a real life historical figure? Because that's a whole other ball game. You know, well, like, I, I never saw it that way. Though. It was always me, like, I'm it was like, always, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> that was always part of the plan. Like part of the plan was I was going to write a certain amount in terms of historical romance. And put that stake in the ground. And then at some point there was going to be phase two. And I had been researching phase two about, uh, it was like three years after I had written the two series. Um, I started researching for one particular subject. Um, and it wasn't like really going anywhere in terms of me pitching it. I mean, it was, it was actually, it was like the first thing that was really starting to get me agent attention because prior to that, I sort of called myself agent poison because I would talk to agents oh, about no. historical romance. And I think that was the beginning point about 2012, 2013-ish when historical romance seemingly became regency. Mm, mm. with the exception of a few people like mm -hmm. Miss Beth. It's like historical romance became Regency. And I kept like thinking, okay, well, one day it's going to turn over and everybody will be welcome. Everybody. <laughs> everybody. And it wasn't happening. 
<laughs> so I'm yeah, like, okay. You, well, you I think put my safety down. Yeah, when you think of that. that's that's mostly that's what, what it is. That's right? what it is. That's what yeah. it is. Nobody was going to say talking about this. This was around about 2017-ish or whatever. I can see which way the wind is blowing. It's time yeah. for phase two. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I started asking around or sending around initial stuff with uh, that first particular approach. And I was starting to get agent attention, which like I said before that, that had not been happening. So I was like, oh, so then I got an agent. Uh, who actually approached me after all of the agent poison stuff? She actually came to me and said she wanted to be my agent. I was like, oh, all right, yeah, okay. Wow. So, um, but then I was on Twitter as I am. <laughs> Twitter is my preferred social media. Um, even if Elon has come in with himself and has tried to do away with it, I, I'm still there. So. That's yeah. that's a, that's a like subject a, for a whole nother show. <laughs> I know it's like to say I'm praying, but you know, whatever. I'm just gonna be there till the wheels fall off. <laughs> 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 I was there, and my editor uh, tweeted out, "Who's going to write about this for me?" So she tweeted out, uh, retweeted someone's article about Ann Lowe. And as a longtime Kennedy aficionado, I'd always known who Ann Lowe was. Of course, I was always interested in who were the Black people in their orbit, in the Kennedy mm-hmm. orbit, how were they towards Black folk, all that other kind of stuff. I'd done all of that kind of reading and research, so I knew about her in the back of my mind. But when she sent out that article and I read it and looked up a few more things, I was like, oh, this is a subject for a novel based on her life. Not everyone is that, but she was very clearly to me. And so very quickly, I wrote much of what ended up being the prologue, sent it to my agent, who by that point, she was like, I hope this person's got something. I don't come to her and ask her to be my client. (laughs) (laughs) And she's not on social media. So I had to tell her how I discovered this, what I said. And I was like, if Tessa likes this, let her know I'm on it. Don't give it to anybody else. And that's how I got the contract. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. (laughs) So, so, okay. So you, you talked a little bit about how you already knew about her and stuff. So for, for somebody who's completely did, doesn't know about Ann Lowe, because I I honestly didn't know about her until you mm-hmm. started talk, you know, talking about her and talking about mm-hmm. the book and stuff. So for somebody who's mm-hmm. completely has no clue about Ann Lowe, tell us a little bit about um, an overview of who she was and how she kind of secured her place in history. Well, she was the... She's best known as the woman who designed one of the most photographed wedding gowns in history. That is the wedding gown slash coronation dress for Jacqueline Bouvier when she married John Kennedy. Because the wedding had 800 people. The entire Senate came. And then the reception had 1,200 people at her stepfather's farm. So it was like more like a coronation. Like it was known that he yeah. was going to be president one day. So it's going to be this big thing. So, and that's why it's one of the most photographed wedding gowns in history. But what in many Jackie uh, biographies, where she's described as the family seamstress, a seamstress, not named, but just like wow. that. Wow. Wow. And most uh, horrifically, in the Ladies' Home Journal issue in 1961, a colored seamstress. Uh, yeah, that, you know, she like had seemed to have no name or whatever. But what had been erased from history was the fact is that, yes, she knew how to sew and construct and all that other kind of stuff, but she was a designer of bespoke custom designed one of a kind formal gowns and wedding gowns for the social elite and she'd been doing it since the teens the 19 teens um and then retired in 1972 uh and that her creations 
are kept in museums because of the care and the craft and the way that the gowns were either put together as well as the ways in which they're decorated um, merited that kind of um, awareness of Anne Lowe as someone who's even again, you say fashion designer, but even someone who is beyond that, an artist. So that someone who has uh, an artistic talent, but is investing it in terms of clothing, women's clothing in particular, in order to have them look a certain kind of way. And all of that had been taken out of many of the Jackie um, biographies for reasons, Uh, not right reasons, but for uh, reasons. Um, And I was like, well, that needs to be known. (laughs) This is something that needs to be known. We need to at least commemorate this woman somehow, if not every February and March, because we get March too, right? Uh, but no, <laughs> beyond that, yeah. And in terms of the, the way these things seem to go, historical fiction can be an integral part of that process and getting someone known, uh, by putting out this kind of historical novel about their life story. So that's why I, I thought, okay, this is what I can do. I am not a textile scholar. Um, and the woman who uh, had begun the project of what what scholars know is needed for someone who is an artist like Ann Lowe just the same as Dolly is an artist that you need a comprehensive scholarly footnoted biography Uh those products take years as well as lots of money (laughs) to generate in terms of doing that kind of research but people can't do those projects if they don't know about the person and why they might be worthy of such study. Mm-hmm. So the woman who started that process uh, that the book is dedicated to is named Margaret Powell. And she had two goals, an exhibit in a museum featuring these crafted dresses of hers, as well as the comprehensive biography. Unfortunately, her her brought short by her death when she's only 38 years old of breast cancer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I felt it kind of serendipitous in terms of Margaret Powell because she worked and lived in my hometown, the museum where she worked is a museum where I used to go as a little kid, right, on field trips and stuff. Uh, the funeral home where the funeral was was right down the street from my high school. I just kind of felt like you know, if there's some way to make the match between those things that she was looking for in terms of her scholarship and the end result that a historical fiction novel might make that bridge happen. So I thought it was all kind of good. Uh, so I'm going to uh, acknowledge a, a comment really quickly um, mm-hmm. about uh, what you just said. So Sherry... Hollister says, I would have thought the Kennedys would have been more open and encouraging to a talented person of color. So, because you were you were saying that, but with the, a lot of the things that you're saying, like the, the coverage, media, books or whatever, is not something that they necessarily wrote. Right, right. It was it was exactly. something else. so mm-hmm. yeah. Like the the fact that the colored seamstress comment is often attributed to Jackie is incorrect. That, and I've looked at that in terms of my um, research. I went and found the actual magazine where that happened and it was put into the exposition by the author of the article, not in quotation marks as Jackie said it. So it cannot be connected to her. Now what is connected to her that a lot of people have had questions about or whatever is Jackie's feelings about the dress, mm. which were not positive. Oh, interesting. Right. Exactly. And that, it, you know, Anne Lowe had someone who had been designing for her family at that point for like six years. Anne Lowe designed um, her mother's second wedding outfit when she married rich man Hugh Auchincloss. Um, 
she uh, designed Jackie's Deba the, when she was Deba the Year. She designed that gown. She designed the gown for her sister when she was Deb of the Year four years later. She had an ongoing relationship with this family in terms of providing those special occasion dresses, as I said, beyond a seamstress. She would have designed her sister Lee's wedding gown because Lee married in April, Jackie married in June, but Lee wanted a cheaper dress. She went to another designer who put all these add-ons in and it didn't end up being cheaper than the in the account. Um, but even beyond that, she, she designed formal Deb dresses, et cetera, for um, her half-sisters, her stepsister. She had an ongoing designer's relationship with these people. But with the wedding gown, as I indicated at the beginning, this was a coronation and the Joseph Kennedy and uh, Janet Auchincloss kind of double teamed Jackie into accepting the fact that the kind of dress that would be required for such an occasion would be huge mm -hmm. so that she could be seen. That wasn't the kind of dress that Jackie would want. It was mm -hmm. like she wanted something more sleek, more modern in, in uh, configuration. And Aunt Lo was going to design wh whatever, whomever paid her. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> so, that makes sense. <laughs> the record of note is that Jackie has always had conflicted feelings about the dress. Um, and so as a result of this book, some people have said, you know, they didn't realize or see or know, but this is the point in terms of having uh, more of this history come out. Uh, on a book club call, I even had one person say, you've destroyed my illusions of Jackie Kennedy. And I said, but you do admit that they were illusions. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then, then you admit that. So you can now look at her as a human being who at the point that I'm writing about her was not the grand icon that we know her to be at the end of her life. She was young. She was, um, I kind of not that sure about this guy. I mean, honestly, uh, <laughs> he was not the most attentive, the most, uh, you know, um, cherishing kind of guy. He, he, you know, he kind of, his father kind of or people will think that you're gay and you'll never be president. I mean, this, this wow. is Kennedy truth here. Um, Jackie was there to fit the bill, you know, and there it was. So um, there, that was all behind her feelings, I think, with the gown that got, you know, that was in there with how she felt wow. about it. So it was- I Anne, really can't Anne's wait to finish, I really can't wait to finish this book. <laughs> Wait to finish this book. <laughs> it was Anne's last commission with Jackie, but not the family. So because she had always done a great job, and, you know, yeah, she yeah. For other members. So okay, so writing historical fiction, even with contemporary fiction, I find myself researching all kinds of things. Whether it's because I'm writing in a city, right. another city, right. and I want to have you know it, mm -hmm. it come off correctly, or I'm writing about a, a you know. A, a career that is something that I'm not familiar with. Like, you know, right now I'm writing about people who own a horse ranch. And so like, I'm always finding myself mm -hmm. having to look up some, right. you know, just that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. even with contemporary, there's all this kind of research that has to be done. Then that's when you're true. writing historical, that's, you know, like tenfold, all this research and stuff, you have to be accurate about the language and what was, what was around and all that. But when you're doing a historical, actual historical figure, that's why like that like kind of blows my mind. So that must create all kinds of additional challenges um, because you're writing about a real life person. So what were some of the challenges that you faced while researching and writing the book? Well, one of the challenges when, when writing about someone who is not going to be, um, you're not going to have lots of primary and secondary resources about a person who is marginalized, you know, in two ways, right? As a black person, as a woman born in Jim Crow, Alabama, 
One of the things that I instantly knew is that, for instance, there would be no birth certificate for her. Mm. Wow. Um, that kind of thing that someone who's writing a book, uh, the historical fiction book, say about, say, Jackie Kennedy, you would have that. You could go and you could find that record. You're not going to find that for Ann Lowe. Um, a- as well as any other, you know, insights into Ann Lowe as a child. Another serendipitous thing happened. Ann Lowe was born and grew up just two counties over in Alabama where my paternal great-grandmother was born and grew up. And they're about two years apart in age. Wow. So I already knew what her childhood would look like um, at that, at that particular point in time. So that gave, gave me a little, little bit of, I mean, we're just illustrating tip. That's what you <laughs> Was um, the fact that if you have someone like that, that it's hard to find things on it, then you want to try to find someone who's a contemporary and to read as much about that contemporary circumstances. I am a Zora Neale Hurston scholar. And similarly speaking, Zora Neale Hurston was born around that same time in that same region of Alabama. Everybody thinks about Zora Neale Hurston in Florida, but she was actually born in Knox uh, Alabama. So I had insights into her childhood, uh, again, another way, so that I could begin to put together. So that's one tip, right? If you have, if you lack uh, a certain kind of um, uh, research, or whatever, is that you find someone who's a contemporary of your figure, and see what it is that has been documented, written, et cetera, about their more famous life in terms of that. You go look at those resources, et cetera, in order to, um, and there's, you know, been uh, two scholarly biographies of Zerula Hurston, as well as a book of her letters to go and examine uh, those things in particular uh, about her childhood. So for, those of us who are recovering these women from the past who have been erased, this is the kind of research that you have to do. It's not as, you know, along the conventional lines in terms of it, but uh, it gives you a starting point, at least, to begin to imagine um, what was there. For Ann Lowe, who was a child bride at the very young age of 12, uh, there have been other uh, books about uh, child marriage in the United States at that particular point in time, um, as well as other famous figures like Loretta Lynn, for instance, who was a child bride as well, or whatever. So there's some of those kinds of uh, stories that you can tap into to potentially showcase what that all could have been like in terms mm-hmm. of fictionalizing those early years. So that's, that's one thing. And I'd been doing that kind of research about um, child brides since I, Hector was a pup, I'd been reading that kind of stuff. It just all happened to come into uh, use for this particular story. I can definitely see why you're saying oh, there was a lot of serendipity here because you mm-hmm. all these different little pieces. A lot of overlaps. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. so okay. So, again, just to recap. So, when you don't have mm-hmm. a lot of fir- uh, primary and secondary uh, mm-hmm. information about a particular person, you're looking at people around them. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. contemporaries who lived at the same time, people who lived right. in the same area, people who lived at had sa- similar situations. Right. Um, right. Exactly. Okay. So, then you put all of this together, and then mm-hmm. how do you decide to tell the story? And I thought it was interesting, too, how you went about the story because like it starts off like her final day of her life and then we right. skip to the day that you know it's the turning I, point I thought yeah and then it's and then we go then we go to that you know that day she comes to her shop and finds out that her these dresses that are ready and for this huge event this like gonna make a name for her have been destroyed mm-hmm. um and then we go back to her, to her childhood. So I thought it was I thought it was kind of interesting how we kind of 
tip back and then got then we went back to her her childhood from the from the beginning. So like right again, so since you don't have these things, you just how do you decide? Okay, how yes. how am I going to tell this? I'm just, like, I'm just I'm just personally fascinated by this process because <laughs> it's one thing like as a fiction author, I can just make up whatever I want, you know. Well, and part so, of that is be, because you are a real person, <laughs> but at the same time, you know what I'm saying. So I'm just fascinated at how that process looks. So. Like I said, so you just gather all of that information together and then you just you just kind of, it allows you to then, because it still is a fiction novel. You right? have to keep in mind that it, it's still, a, that's what I was about to say. It is yeah, still a it's fiction still a, it's still a, novel. It's still a, it's still a so fiction it's, novel. So it's, still it's not a mind. biography. It's not a, you still you know, have to think about. Right. Exactly. You still have to do that. Right. And so you still, the, the whole point, the reason in terms of the description of the wedding gown and not bridesmaids gowns and her bridal shop, that was a true story um, that she had to come through that, uh, you know, less than weeks before the wedding. That was true. It all had to be recreated. Um, but, uh, and Lowe talked about that in the, apartment above the shop, somebody left the bathtub running overnight and that that was spilled down to the shop. But as a novelist, I know I have to do something to get readers to keep turning pages. So I structured it as a mystery that someone purposefully mm -hmm. did this mm -hmm. to her. This is the reason why you would go back to the beginning of her life to see who would be the culprits as her sister, sister Sally asked her, who hates you enough to do this yeah, to you, yeah. Danny, so um, that you can <laughs> read through her life and think about who might have done such a terrible thing. Yeah. Yeah, that struck me how, that, how the, the person her phrases this question, the question, who hates you enough to do this, so. Wow. Okay, so then that was that's the perfect segue because you gave us that first tip about Mm -hmm. you know, studying mm -hmm. contemporaries right. or what have you. So that leads right. us into the next question, which is what are your mm -hmm. three best tips for uh, a current or aspiring author who might be interested in writing fiction yeah. about a historical figure? So you already gave us the well, one. That's, I said. that's the one. Yeah, I did want to mm -hmm. get that one out there. Um, yeah. Because I think a lot of people feel um, like the rest, you know, when you, you run there and say, oh, they don't have the conventional primary stuff they don't have you know uh certain aspects and that's not that's not enough to stop writing historical fiction novel whomever's going to write that comprehensive scholarly biography that needs to be footnoted is going to have to write a whole thing about birth certificates and the circumstances when children are born in Jim Crow Alabama and the best best person's job that's my into of getting story. Um, like one of the things that would be helpful to know on the birth certificate is was like who her father really was and what did he do? And this was mm -hmm. one of the things that I had been asked about um, in a recent book club in terms of, oh, what did Jack Lowe do that was so bad that he had to be on a chain gang? Which is where and how her first pedophile, the husband, um, Lee, said that he knew about who Jack Lowe was, right? We don't have any idea about Jack Lowe and who he actually was. This, that's the name that has been given and handed down. Um, we don't know much about him, but as someone who's written about the system of peonage previously, I knew that uh, a black man at that particular point in, in the South could be compelled to be on a chain gang for any reason. Like he's behind on his grocery bill. Um, no, you know, if anything, that's true. That is a good point. Have to be a lesson in, in, the, uh, in terms of that. But what I wanted was for people to get the sense that Lee was the nefarious one in, in terms of that. Um, so it's things like that. 
like that you, you have to be prepared for. So, okay, so another tip I would say if you're selecting a historical person is um, make sure that you somehow connect with any descendants or you might select someone who doesn't have any descendants uh, in terms of such project. So um, you could con contact people who are descendants and uh, see what it is that they have in terms of historical stuff that may not exist out there in the larger world. You do have to be prepared for the fact that um, they might not like such a project uh, in terms of that. Um, you're well, you may be welcome to sort of explain, you know, the whole thing of like that this can be a bridge, this can be an avenue by which people can come to learn more about your ancestor who mm. had been unjustly history. I might uh, I like to call historical uh, fiction, particularly this biographical historical fiction, is the thing that puts butts in history class seats. Um, and people, you know, tend not to think of it that way, but even if someone is fictionalizing certain things in a person's life, what gets them interested, what makes, compels them to go look, to go find out more things, to go do the research, that's what we want, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That's the good thing, which is why in uh, this kind of historical fiction, you're always going to have that author's note in the back that talks about the process by which they fit certain things were fictionalized and also have a list of books yeah. uh, accompanying that in terms of what was used uh, in order to do research. And in my case, um, Margaret Powell's thesis, which um, prior to the publication of this book was not out there on the internet, but now it is um, in terms of people who are able to go look at that and to really get uh, a sense of what else she provided me um, by um, the uh, kind of research work of her hands in terms of the dresses. I knew I was not going to be able, particularly during the pandemic, to get my hands on in low gown to look at how it was put together in terms of putting self in the con contemplating how would such a document together, a, a garment be put together. Most particularly because I am not a seamstress. <laughs> right. <laughs> my mother was, which helped. Right? Yeah, it I'm helped sure because I'm whenever sure my mother was yeah. sewing something, yeah, I was the one who uh, was picked to be her company, you know, because she would always want to sew with company in the room. So I would be the company and I would sit there while she was sewing. It wasn't myself, but it came in handy in terms of Again, beginning to figure out how she would put a garment together in a, a, a particular kind of way. And Margaret Powell's work in that thesis also um, did that. So that's the second awesome. thing in terms of like when you're picking someone, descendants can be a good thing, can also be a not good thing. And you want to try to contact them um, earlier on in the project. Awesome. And let me just say a quick hello to Cheryl. Hi, Thank Cheryl. you so much for joining us. And I, I also noticed that there is, there is, it might be a problem with the connection between here and Facebook because people can watch okay. from Facebook because it's posted on Facebook as well. And they usually can comment from Facebook. I'm definitely getting mm -hmm. a note saying that, um, that there's some kind of disconnect. So if you are yeah. on Facebook watching us and you're wondering how come we're not acknowledging you or, or seeing your whatever your questions or whatever, we can't see you <laughs> for yeah, some reason yeah. right now. I, I haven't seen any of the questions. Either you can yeah. follow the the uh, link to YouTube and watch it directly from YouTube or just know we appreciate you. We know you're there. We're sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it'll be worked out, whatever is happening between StreamYard yeah. and Facebook. But right now we can only see people who are, are on the are watching directly on the YouTube page. So um, but so thank you for joining us. Uh, so okay, so that has helped a lot to um 
you know, that your mother was a seamstress <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> to be able to understand mm-hmm. more of that mm-hmm. and to be able to have that reason, <laughs> you know, all of that. Yeah. But um exactly. what you said about the descendants, that makes a mm-hmm. lot of sense because I, I wondered mm-hmm. about that. Like, do, what do does the family think of that? Because you look at, you know, projects that have happened before and, you mm-hmm. know, Green Book or whatever the project was. Yeah. Or maybe mm-hmm. the family was not happy whether, you mm-hmm. know, one mm-hmm. Aretha Franklin biopic or another, you know, where the family might not have been happy. Or on the other hand, you have products where the family is very involved and, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and, and therefore, um, bless, you know, has, you know, blesses it. <laughs> so what yeah. was your experience? Did you have to con- contact the descendants? Were there the con- descendants for you contacted? You know, how did that work out? <laughs> well, there are two things in terms of uh, Ann Lowe's descendants. Um, one of them was um, that her, as you read the book, she had that one son, right? So she only has one son. From that one son, from his marriage, uh, it's a female line of descent. So it's harder to find the descendants prior to the research. So I did not have connection with the descendants until after the book came out, which is one of the reasons why I'm suggesting this is a good thing to do prior to. Um, Linda, who is um, Andlo's great granddaughter who lives in New Jersey, had things that um, could have been helpful in terms yeah. of writing the novel. But I mean, I see them as, as, and I, as you know, discussed this with Linda at length, that in terms of whatever potential adaptation projects or whatever come forward from it, those things will still be helpful uh, in terms of, you know, that. Um, One of the things when she, of course, she read the book, of course, that she had was, you know, some of the ways in which Anne had her shops. But from a novelist's point of view, a lot of that had to be condensed, Mm -hmm. right? So she had to explain that to her. It's like, We couldn't have her in each and every shop that she had been in. A lot of those experiences and uh, making composite characters, that kind of thing, had to be condensed in order, again, to maintain a reader's attention in terms of uh, the story, et cetera. But as I say, these things can be used better in an adaptation and clarified better. And of course for whomever is going to come in with that comprehensive scholarly biography. Such a thing takes a minimum of three years, right, to write. Um, And I was able to write this with a little bit more give because of the pandemic, because I was at home teaching on Zoom, et cetera. Um, In terms of producing a historical fiction novel, which by my estimates would take somewhere more like, six months to a year and a half or something like that, um, that, uh, you know, I could, I could do that because I had that particular time devoted at that particular point. Right. But these are, these are involved things that, you know, require a lot of, uh, if it's being done properly, time, attention and care, uh, I think people saw on Twitter where, you know, I'd been talking about, I had been approached, to do something uh, in regards to Queen Charlotte. And I was not going to do that unless I had the appropriate materials to do that. Mm -hmm. One of the things that in the historical fiction that I write is that what I've produced so far is Anne Lowe novel and then my subsequent novel, which will be out next year, is that I'm writing in my time period that I know as a scholar, I have the backdrop firmly in place already, historically speaking. There are a lot of, there's a lot of that stuff that I already know in terms of the language, how people are going to relate to each other, you know, all of that other kind of stuff. So I already know that. If I'm going to write about somebody like Queen Charlotte, I need to go to Germany. I need to go and be in mecklenburg Strelitz. I need to have access to potential translators or potentially, you know, to learn German. Uh, 
to see what her youth was like, et cetera, in particular, because she doesn't get married till she's 17 and all that. And then I need to go to Great, Great, Great Britain where she lives. That's what I need mm. to do that project properly. If you want a crap project, <laughs> then you'll pay me, you know, some little piddling amount of money and whatever. And, you know, I'm not going to have my name on that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Wow. There you go. Right. So you yeah. gave us, so we got the one, two, and what's your third tip? Okay. For? So uh, in terms of that, the third tip for uh, writing based on um, a historical figure is that if when you're choosing a person, like what I said earlier about, um, I knew looking at her life that she was a suitable subject. You do have to look for a certain kind of um, life events that parallel dramatic structure. If you're doing the thing that's going to make your historical fiction um, uh, adhere more to the history without overall change. There is a particular very well-known historical fiction author, I'm not going to name, who totally fictionalized a love interest for a very famous man. And you don't find that out until the end of the book. That's not the kind of thing I'm talking about. Um, you want to make sure uh, that that particular person has their own, uh, you know, like I said, if it's like this kind of uh, four act thing that you're looking for either part of their life or over the course of their life in order to um, appropriately give this person the dramatic treatment, so to speak, without, uh, you know, um, making up. I mean, that's not what I'm talking about. I sort of think about <laughs> historical fiction in the way of like, there's certain tent poles of fact and that you're stringing between them with conversations, et cetera, but you're still ending up with those tent poles of fact firmly in place. Um, I like that, tent poles yeah. of fact. You know, yeah. that is actually a really great kind of illustration of, of, of how to think of it. And like, mm -hmm. that actually mm -hmm. helps a lot to think, mm -hmm. okay, you have to have these tent poles of the, these things mm -hmm. we know to be true that mm -hmm. are, you know, provably true. Right. And then we're just kind of stringing between them that's with what it. might have happened. <laughs> that's it. That's it. That and like so beautiful. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, that's what I do for a living, right? <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> you know, somebody had said something about, well, Margaret Powell did this. I was like, yeah, she did. That's why I dedicated the book to her. And I mentioned her at the end or whatever. But what Margaret didn't do or didn't have to do was to think through uh, the conversation that, um, that Anne is having while she's fitting these wedding dresses uh, or the bridesmaids dresses at the last minute in the house where there's already a lot of activity, a lot that's going on to get ready for this wedding, et cetera. Margaret Powell didn't have to envision any of that. That was me. So I get credit for that, <laughs> the fiction writer. That's why my name is on the book. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, so some people was like, yeah, well, I think, yeah, well, I, I, hey, please go read her thesis. It's wonderful work, um, and really would have been like the building of a, of a great project. And like I said, I'm still desperately hoping that someone will take it up and finish what it was that she set out to do. There will be an exhibit uh, in uh, September. 9th to January 7th in uh, went at the Winter Thur in Delaware, which is just outside of Philadelphia. There will be 40 and low gowns there. Mm. Yeah, Very so nice. several people, book clubs, etc. I know I'm going at some point. I haven't yeah. determined when. I was going to say, I know uh, you are. I know you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> etc um that are going uh to see the gown because they're all over the country in different museums i still believe there's probably a whole lot of stuff in people's attics or yeah. whatever under yeah their i can just imagine that's probably that has true. not been discovered yet yeah 
Um, but at least these 40 make an initial, like almost a capsule kind of event. And again, it's so important for that kind of thing to happen so that this biographer who, some, who somehow, I believe, will get funded and will be able to take the couple of years necessary in order to get that and click of the kind of comprehensive biography that Ann Logie found. So, said so yes, my right third one. About, he said a mouthful <laughs> well, right there yeah. about the being funded. Uh, yeah. If you want a okay, proper, because, if you want yeah, it done properly, I mean, you know what I'm saying? People are don't out have there to acting eat, like, you eat know, while you're doing that research. <laughs> so. And I'm doing this while, you know, I'm teaching four classes yeah. and, you know, I have my husband and also yeah. and my son. Well, not as much. He's 21, but, you know, they still yeah. need you. Yeah. And so, you know, there's, <laughs> the, you know, yes. um, so there's all this <laughs> other stuff. And it, you know, but at that, during this point is when my, both my father and my sister were ill. Mm -hmm. um, I had a lot going on. Um, and, you know, Shorty, someone who, didn't have a day job and all of that other kind of stuff probably could have produced this book much more quickly. But yeah. um, that's just nope. some of the things. I, I like to eat and I like to have a roof over my head. I know that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I love your three tips that you gave yes. us. And so this, I'm going to recap them real quick. Um, okay. The mm -hmm. first was to, you know, if you don't have the primary and secondary information that you need to look for contemporaries of that person, um, other people who lived in similar situations at that um, same time period or what have you. Um, number two was to connect with the descendants of the historical figure and um, or to select someone who doesn't have descendants. <laughs> <laughs> and three was to find a suitable subject who's a person whose life fits um, kind of the dramatic need that you have for mm -hmm. um, storytelling. Um, so what I'm gonna, so that's a recap for because I know some people probably yeah. can't switch over later or whatever. And I can but, just give a real quick example in terms of uh, a lot of people talk about Zelda Wynn, who uh, was supposedly credited, and there's a lot of, there's some controversy about it, credited with um, developing the Playboy Bunny uniform as mm. a black woman designer or whatever. Mm. Her life doesn't have that traumatic structure. Mm. No, I can, I, can, I, I can totally get that. Mm -hmm. You know, like, because because what you're talking about about the tent poles and mm -hmm. and kind of writing in between mm -hmm. that's the same thing they do in movies. I mean, yes, yes, even ones we love like hidden figures. Mm -hmm. You know, that's some of the, right. some of the characters are you know it's a combination of of people or a person who I think wasn't even didn't was didn't exist at all. Right, like Kevin's uh, character. Kevin's character uh, and that moment was a memo. Was yes. not as dramatic, you know. Yes. All of that stuff. Yes. So that's exactly. common. So that's mm -hmm. not, you know, mm -hmm. it's not mm -hmm. unusual that a book would do. It's it. common, but what it will do, like for a lot of people that led them to that wonderful, wonderful book uh, that Marco Shetterly wrote, um, and where you can really find out uh, the Catherine Johnson was awesome, but so was Dorothy Vaughn. Um, and, you know, the, uh, really Dorothy Vaughn, Octavia Spencer's character, should have had her own movie, to be honest, right? She was just that amazing. So, oh, but wow. that's, and that's what, you know, that historical fiction can do. And uh, it might happen down the road, you don't know. So just say a quick hello. Hey. One of our uh, viewers over on Facebook that said hello. We can't see your name, <laughs> Ann. <laughs> Hi, Facebook user. Your face. So um, you, if you go down to the bottom of the description, where the video is, there should be a link where you can go and give stream your permission to see mm -hmm. your name and your um, avatar for Facebook. But thank you so much for watching and thank you for your comment. And hello, Mama Tony. Aww, well, thank hi, you Mama very Tony. much. Thank you. You're too thank kind. You. Yes, she's very kind. <laughs> we appreciate you. Thank, <laughs> you. thank you for joining us. And Cheryl asked a question and says, forgive me if you've already addressed this. Do you prefer, and I, I don't think, well, we talked about why. Mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. but Jess do you prefer real life persons or fictional characters to write about well if we're, if we're talking about you know in terms of the historical aspect in terms of what I was paid for my historical romances versus this any day ain't no question <laughs> <laughs> You said that oh, that answers yeah. the question. You're <laughs> just talking about the money. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
because I told you I like. I, to eat I hear you. I, have a I hear you. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, I hear you. that's, 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 that's a whole works, different but, class of mm, yeah. I get mm, you. Yeah, I, yeah, but I you mean know, that's again because of I think historical romance and where it has been over this time period. Yeah, you know, so <laughs> that is interesting. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. certainly mm -hmm. makes a difference, doesn't it? it? Does. <laughs> now, it sure does. if mm -hmm. if look, so let me take that question a little bit further. <laughs> Money was not a barrier or an, or an mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. Which one would you prefer? Writing about this is this uh, writing about real life unsung black women and bringing them to the fore so that they can be known about, revered, etc. Has been uh, something I have been interested in doing for a very very long time. It's always building to this I for me, I yeah. and mm -hmm. that is a wonderful thing to be able to do that because, like I said, just. Think of how many people probably had no idea who she was. I know I personally did not. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, every time I discover um, a new story about a, a Black creator who was unsung, who, you know, right. mm -hmm. the woman who created the security system, just all these different right. amazing people. Right. There are, and there are so many. And it's so like, many. even I, you know, and, you know, when I find a new one, it's like, wow, really, you know? Yeah, there's yeah. there's one of the things that we yeah. use. I think even the cell phone was created yeah. by a black woman. There's, so there's just so many things that we use in our everyday lives or whatever that we don't even realize mm -hmm. a black creator or, or inventor mm -hmm. um, is behind it. And it's like a lot of what you you were just saying about Ann Lowe about how even when they talked about her or mentioned her, she yeah. they didn't consider feel she was worthy of being named. Yeah. Whereas and, if I, it very much, I believe, if it was a white person, let alone a white man, <laughs> absolutely, the name would be everywhere. It would be on, it would be on the product. You know, we, we all know who invented it. Well, the whole and, thing in terms of fashion is always about that the name has to be said, right? So when you're not saying Enlo's name and that the women in the social register like to pass her name amongst themselves... Uh, and, you know, to, they called her, you know, the society's best kept secret, all of that. Um, I'm sure you can get continuous work, but you're not going to get appreciated. You're not going to get renowned in a certain way. Right. And there are questions about why they did that. Was it because they wanted to keep the prices low <laughs> or, or, you know, they didn't want any duplication of their dresses, which she didn't do anyway. You know, all of that other kind of stuff that could be tapping into um, why. But someone at one, at one of the signings came up to me and said, you know, they just thought she was a Black woman who just made some dresses. Mm, and I said, well, you know, that's, that's wow. probably true. Yeah, is that the reality of what it is that she actually did in terms of her craft was not appreciated even by the people that she designed for. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah. It, it is so good that we have people telling stories about mm -hmm. this or even like on Instagram, a lot of times I'll see those, you know, posts where they have like a list of several people who have created things that we just didn't know. You know mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. I always try to share those when I can because I'm like, I didn't know. <laughs> and yeah, they need, we yeah. need to learn more about them. So not like we now you've got me wanting to find mm -hmm. out more about these folks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, and it's, so, like you said, it's like, you know, because it's just like you see one of these things, it's like, okay, so what else Yeah, don't we know about? And at one point, you know, when I was younger, I used to get mad about it. But then I was like, it's better to take the energy and spread the word. So Absolutely. that, you know, people who are in our age group and especially those who are younger don't come up without not knowing, you know. That's right. I That's even right. when I think about the whole hidden figures thing, I mean, you know, my goodness. Yeah. yeah having known about those women being at NASA, what that m might have that done for, you know, I, I, I didn't like calculus. When I got the trig. I was still cool. But when calculus came, I was like, I can't hang. Right anymore, but I don't know if I know <laughs> about these women who had gone plowed through calculus. I don't know, you know. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, saying not just for me, but for uh, lots of other for, uh, for girls, yeah, countless you know young women 
you know, know to the extent inspired. we're known that there were women who were there doing a certain thing. That's important to know. Yes, absolutely. Um, a comment from Angela. Thanks for joining us, Angela. Oh, I know you were doing something Angela earlier today. Angela, thanks. She's like, hardcore. Earlier today, Man, I so talking, appreciate her. Yeah, you were talking earlier to Bill, so thank you for joining us. Um, <laughs> I absolutely love by her own design. It is historical fiction at its finest, and like I said, I'm not finished with it, but from what I'm reading so far, I have to agree because I like I am, I am totally you know, into it, like I said, and I ain't got no time to read, for sure, and I have been trying to sleep. I heard that, when well, you're on deadline. And read, whatever, oh, I, can. Oh, <laughs> whenever I can. Sorry. Whenever I can, so. And then Angela also says, thank you for telling Ann Lowe's story. Yeah, I absolutely, absolutely agree. So, we talked it's about the pleasure. fact that several um, other, you know, that this is becoming more popular, this, I, this idea of, um, of telling uh, these historical, you know, fictional novels. Because I remember when I, I can't, uh, I feel like it was maybe five years ago that I really paid attention to the fact that mm. this historical fiction, I'm like, what is, you know, like, how can it be, how can it be fiction? How can it be a novel if it's, <laughs> so like, right, right. Yeah. It's like, yeah. <laughs> I had to like kind of, I got to kind of do that. But now I, you see them a lot there. now. And so are there, uh, uh, historical fiction novels about real life characters that you would recommend to readers? Well, I know that for me, you know, when I started thinking back about this, um, the ones that uh, were inspirational and even as a scholar from a scholarly viewpoint, I think it started a certain thing uh, in this one particular case, uh, Douglas's Women by Jewel Parker's Rhodes. Um, and notice what I said. I said women, multiple. <laughs> so about uh, that she uh, published, I think it was 2010 when it came out. And it's the dual narrative of Frederick Douglass's wife and white mistress. Mm, interesting. Very interesting. And I, I definitely know about, I know I knew about that situation and that there were mul the multiple, right. but right. I did not know there was a... So, uh, yeah, Jewel Parker Rose looked at that and said, now that's a dramatic situation. Oh, yes, that's, that's a dramatic with. right there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there, there's there's so much, about, you know, there's so much mm -hmm. to unpack there. <laughs> so like, there is some drama there. Yeah. yeah, I always look forward when it's time to teach uh, Frederick Douglass, because a lot of my students don't know, so... Mm, yeah, he be messy, honey. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. They, yeah, they get into it. You can, uh, you can be <laughs> brilliant and impactful to the, <laughs> and also messy. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, but the way that she, I mean, like I said, you know, the the whole thing in terms of of what required, and I, I think even now because of my next book, it really kind of inspired the fact that I could do my next book the way that I did. Um, she I just really did a great job um, in terms of it. And I think not by coincidence, there were a lot of what I call wife of books that came after that. Mm. And I don't think Jewel Parker Rhodes gets the credit for kicking it off. So you have many New York Times bestsellers that were wife of, the wife of Ernest Hemingway, the wife of F. Scott Fitzgerald, the wife of Charles Lindbergh, all getting their day in the sun and being on bestseller lists and all this stuff. But I think Joel Parker Rhodes kicked it off wow. in terms of that trend in historical fiction. Now you're so also one. making me want to read uh, all of those, like F. Scott Fitzgerald. Like, what was his wife's name? It was a Rose. Was his wife name Zelda? <laughs> Zelda. Zelda, has, right. Zelda, has, Zelda. Zelda has several historical fiction books because she was would a imagine. real mess. I would imagine. She was a real mess. And of course, a large part of that in terms of the story was were those her words or his words? Mm. Because mm -hmm. she was a very talented writer, too. Yes. Yes. I can't mm -hmm. remember where I saw something about that. And mm -hmm. that was a, yeah. was a So, yeah, that's full of dramatic potential there. Um, <laughs> and then the other one um, was The Black Rose by Tanana Reeve Du who took up that project in the wake of Alex Haley's death, that it was something that he was working on. The Black Rose is a historical fiction novel about Madam C.J. Walker, 
Mm. Life. So um, while there is self-made this on Netflix or whatever, go read The Black Rose <laughs> instead. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And <laughs> and then uh, we have a kind of Shay, baby, Freddy. don't know the, uh, the Freddie mess. I'll be teaching Freddie uh, in mid-March. Shay, you welcome to come to class, girl. Cause... <laughs> <laughs> she said, I just, wait, you I don't what, know honey, if you the story. Child, I got to get on it. Yeah. Honey, be prepared. It's a mom. Freddie was, Freddy was messy. <laughs> Freddie was a mess, honey. What did I say? We what do we do every February? We put up the big head, right? The big head posters, right? Ooh, child. I just give you a little insight. He said he said he said the first time I married for the race of my mother, and the second time I married, I married for the race of my father. <sighs> so. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> essay. And then, Cheryl says, oh, oh long to go. Yeah, I've okay, either of you been a clean river. Yeah, what she did with that though—that was a family story uh, that she made into historical fiction. I do have a messy family. I do need to get on that. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's what my mother said. Write about the family. You know, I'm saying, like, hey, mom, but it's already yeah, bad then, enough. You are. <laughs> If you are the descendants, you ain't got to reach out to nobody. <laughs> okay, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like so, it, I like it. so you I gave say. us a little teaser hint about the fact that you're working on something else. So give us a little taste of tell, tell us what's up next for you. Oh, this is finished and it's in for edits. So American Daughters is the story of the secret interracial friendship between the daughter of Theodore Roosevelt and the daughter of Booker T. Washington. Mm. So it's like the friendship between the white princess of America and the black princess of America. Uh, and starts from 1901 uh, in terms, and goes into the 20s. Um, but they were friends until uh, Portia's death in um, 1978. Um, yeah, and you know, just yeah, <laughs> taking a look at these two different women, but very similar in a lot of ways. The way they formed their friendship in the wake of um, some might remember hearing about when in 1901, after McKinley was assassinated and Teddy becomes president, he invites Booker T over for dinner. He's he not thinking anything about that. It's like, oh, it's just Booker T. Washington have them over for dinner. And honey, folks lost their mind. I bet, I bet they did. Lost <laughs> their minds. Started, <laughs> did, drew cartoons about he was, did Booker T. Washington was in the White House raping Alice. Alice wasn't even oh there yet. God. I mean, just all kinds of hot craziness that went on. But these two girls in the wake of all of that, the two young women at that point, being their father, their father's eldest daughters who were creating trouble and mess for their daddies. Oh wow. Came okay. together and became friends. <laughs> so let me first of all <laughs> hey, she a mess. She's she's a well, she damn Freddie. Freddy. Uh-huh. She went to go look. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Woo child. And Mama Tony said, I read Came Over Years and Years. Okay, I, I, I have not read that one. So I mean, I need she's to, bringing it I up. Need I mean, you know, it was a New York Times bestseller and stuff. Maybe I should be writing about my family. I <laughs> know that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's right. Mm-hmm. And then Cheryl says, This is not an African American uh, novel, but I love Outlander by Diana um, Gabaldon. But that's that's not based on a real person, is it? I didn't think it was. Okay. Okay. But it's, she it's, just it's, enjoyed it's it. That's it's okay. You on. enjoyed it, Cheryl. That's good. Yeah. That's good. It's not based yeah, on it's a real person. But yeah. It's history. You know, yeah. and, and you know what? I have it. It's on the shelf somewhere here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I just haven't gotten around to reading i haven't even i haven't it's it, a big i book. haven't seen eat the show either or because i'm it's like a okay, lot of words <laughs> and I can, <laughs> so yeah. here we are many 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 years later and i still haven't read the book <laughs> so i still haven't read, watched the show so okay so and when can we expect this 
American daughters. Not well, yet. they haven't told me, but sometime probably early 2024. Okay. I, I'm hoping Women's History Month next year. I think that. Oh, that would be cool. awesome. So, mm -hmm. and and just what prompted you to tell the story of these daughters? What what was it about them, or how or how did you come across it and just say, okay, I want to tell this story? I've been doing a lot of uh, the research for the ideas that I've had uh, in terms of women or whatever around Booker T. Washington for a while. I've done a lot of research. What people don't know about Booker T. Washington is that he was married to three women within a 10-year span. And the ways in which those women, at least the second wife, should be properly credited as a founder of Tuskegee, but it's not. Mm, wow. For her contributions. Wow. Just because she was Mrs. Washington. Mm. And that's that kind of thing that, you know, needs to be uh, excavated and, and talked about and have more research done. It's like, what does a woman have to do to get credited to be starting an institution when she went and got money? Wow. What does a woman have to do? That's not right. I am so, glad that people like you are shining the light <laughs> on history like that and, and, and yes, starting to give folks like Ann Lowe mm -hmm. and Mrs. Booker T. Washington mm -hmm. the credit that they deserve. All uh, three of them, yeah. So, wow. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, Portia is the one who is in American Daughters. So my hope is if there's interest in Portia, there might be interested in her mother and stepmothers. So we'll see. Interesting, interesting. Okay, I'm, I like it. I like it. So, tell readers where they can connect with you online. Well, as I said, Twitter, you know, there's <laughs> at Piper Hughley, but also Facebook, which is Piper G Hughley, which is the more active page. I am on Instagram. I'm coming to learn more about it. Piper underscore Hughley, um, and uh, my website, which is piperhughley.com. Okay. And Piper, I'm going to need you to go to your <laughs> website and update it with some. I know. <laughs> I know. I, know. I, I need to. I, I, my so poor neglected. All this. I'm like, where's my poor fantastic ne books and stuff? I'm poor neglected website. I need to give it some love. I know. Yes. <laughs> Damn. You are too fabulous. I want, oh, I need, yes. I'm like, I need okay. to ask like, <laughs> you. Like, make me work too hard. <laughs> So sorry, <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm so thrilled that, like I said, that you've done this book, and mm -hmm. I, I am loving what I'm reading. I'm, I'm fascinated by like the whole process and stuff. So thank you for coming and sharing that with yeah, us, no and coming at this time to talk to us, and especially, you know, yeah. like I said, I don't even, I didn't even plan for it to be Black History Month while we had this conversation. I, it was just a matter of like you know, inv inviting folks, but you pick, you pick the day, you pick the, um, you oh, said, select the day. So you was on, you was on the money with it. You it's was on the money. Season. Thank you. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> and it was nobody crazier about this time of year with Black History Month than my sister. So I've been, you know, doing what I can to keep the days because I know what she would want me to do, get the yeah. word out about uh, I know Black folk. So I love it. I love mm -hmm. it. We <laughs> honor, honor her. Yeah. Yes. Why you continuing to share these stories of these amazing Absolutely. folks in history yeah. during Black History Month? We, we're going to talk about it all year long, but right. especially, but especially, gonna, especially, <laughs> especially, going to talk about it right now. So, thank you again so much for for joining us, Piper. And if you know, as viewers and stuff, you want to learn more about Piper, go to her website or follow her. Start with Twitter. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you. Start with Twitter because that's where she, she knows she over is, there. Uh, hearing her unabashed opinions about things. <laughs> they are trust. Me, they are actually abashed. It's like you know, and Green Gables. They could be way I worse. Have, I have so much more I could say, but I don't. So yeah. <laughs> I, I love it I love it so thank you for taking some of your time this evening to come and join us thank you for having me Reese. <laughs> and for everybody else here thank you for, for joining us if you enjoyed the show hit the like uh, you subscribe and be sure to share the show so that other people can find it as well 
Um, my next guest on March 7th is JC Lee. We'll be talking about exploring Asian culture oh, yeah, like in yeah. contemporary mm-hmm. romances. Yeah. So we're going to have um, Rex for you for that as well. So, um, and if you enjoy author chats, be sure to check out the Brown book series that Shea Baby mm-hmm. runs. Uh, the link is on my um, Facebook page and my favorites or recommended channels. She has talked to so many amazing authors. So definitely I don't think I talked to her about her. Freddie. That's why she didn't know because I didn't talk to her. <laughs> <laughs> see, see. Mm-hmm. So make sure you definitely, definitely check her out. And you know, if you come later and you're watching the replay, thank you so much for joining us. If you leave questions and stuff in on the page, I'll be sure to refer them to Piper um, so that I'm you can get your questions answer answered. So yeah. thank y'all so much for joining yeah. us. You have a good evening and. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody.